Good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. Today we have Brother Yafet with us. And for those of you who regularly join us, um, you are no stranger. He has shared with us um, in the past on betrayal and also herbal remedies. And today he comes to speak on adverse experiences in childhood. And so let us begin with a word of prayer. Kind Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, the ability to come together today to speak on, to reflect on, and to learn more about this topic. Lord, we live in a world of sin and it was never your intention for us to experience um, the horrible consequences of sin. But we thank you that you are a God who created a solution and that in you and with you is the power of transformation. And these difficulties can be used in ways that only you can to minister to others and to grow in our walk with you. Lord, we pray over the speaker of the hour. We pray over your manservant. We thank you for his willingness to share with us and that his openness to the Holy Spirit to receive um, guidance and direction on this topic. Please be with all of those who are here today and who will be listening to this recording at a later time. Lord, these and all other mercies we pray in your precious name. Thy will be done. Amen. 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 All right. I guess I can start now, Sister Natasha. Yes, Brother Yafet. Amen. So I just want to thank you so much for your patience, everyone, for those of you who've been waiting. Um, the devil has definitely been attacking me while I was doing this presentation. I mean, several supernatural attacks, um, even this morning when I was finalizing everything. And and then, of course, as I come on the computer, just it's just amazing how um, how we need God's protection. We need God's continual guidance and protection. So I'm praying and you pray for me that God will bless and lead us. I want to start off with a verse. And it's in 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in 14. Um, let's begin in verse 13. It says, For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness and sobriety. I, I want to preface by saying what I don't think this verse is intended to mean. Uh, I don't, you know, people will say things uh, all the time. And so I just want to make sure I'm very clear on that. Um, this verse, I don't think this verse is saying that if you don't bear children, you're not going to be saved. Okay. Um, but I do think this verse is very indicative of a principle that I think is important for us to keep in mind because there's there's responsibility and there's duties for those of us who are in positions of authority. So uh, in this case, a, a parent, a child bearer, the mother in specific, uh, is in a large degree responsible for the outcome for a child's formation of character. And so uh, Paul here is bringing out the fact that, you know, there is a relationship between our own salvation and how we form the character. Because remember, like is forming like. Um, we'll see this in our presentation today. But there's a, um, a principle in Genesis chapter 1 where it says, let every seed that is in itself, has a seed in and of itself in the fruit thereof, made bear fruit after its own kind. So if, you know, Jesus put it like this, by their fruits, you shall know them. In other words, you're not going to see uh, an apple fall from an orange tree. If it's an orange tree, you're going to look for oranges on the ground. 
if you look at the fruit, you know what it came from. That's why one of the best ways to indicate someone's uh, prosperity in their ministry is to look at what their uh, children and their fruits of their labors are. So um, I think that's the principle here. Um, today uh, is a special day. It's Mother's Day, at least in, uh, in the U.S. And so uh, we want to celebrate Mother's Day, but also to recognize there's an importance um, regarding this particular position because of these uh, precious creations that God has given to us um, in the form of children. So um, the presentation is called These Little Ones, A Godly Sea, Child Abuse and How to Overcome It. So we're going to, to do a little bit, bit of a Bible study here today. Okay. Um, and let's see if I can move this so I can see the screen properly. It can't really, oh, here we go. Maybe that'll help. So the first thing I want to establish is that ignorant, can, can you still see me, Sister Natasha, or, and the screen perfectly and everything's fine, or at least the screen? Yes, we can, see. Sure you can see. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, first thing I want to establish is ignorance. Ignorance. Ignorance is not bliss. You probably heard of the saying, ignorance is bliss. But I'm here to tell you that ignorance is not bliss. Uh, the greatest bane of society, I'm, I'm convinced, is not ignorance. The greatest bane of society is, is not um, rather the, the uh, criminals in, in, in prison. It is not the, the worst kind of heinous acts. Um, the greatest bane of society is ignorance. And you might say, well, how can that be? Because, uh, you know, it, it doesn't seem as such. It doesn't seem like that. Well, let me ask you, behind every perpetrator, was there not someone who, they were not born like that. Um, they had to cultivate, they had to be exposed, environmental uh, upbringing, etc. There was influence that led someone that made their own choices to go in that direction. So my question is, where were their parents? Um, we're going to find actually in uh, the Bible, it's very careful to mention the names of the mothers uh, behind the kings that chose not to serve God. It says specifically their, the mother's names. I thought that was very interesting uh, because of the influence, uh, the early influences that these children can have. And yes, the fruits are very, very destructive, but uh, what was happening during those formative years uh, will tell in later life. Um, the Bible actually says this principle. It's always been this way. Uh, God's, God's people have, have more or less been the same throughout the centuries and millennia. It says, my people, God's people, God's church, are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Not, not a lack of degrees, not a lack of money, not a lack of prestige and fame, and just a lack of knowledge. Lack of understanding. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, so there's will involved here. Because thou has rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. But then it, it goes even worse. Thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. And then what does it say? I will also forget thy children. Now this is serious because that means the failure on the part of the parents does not just stop with them. That would be bad enough. But the principle here is that there are repercussions, there are downstream repercussions for the children and their children and their children, even unto the third and fourth generation. Satan comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy primarily through ignorance. That's how he's destroying. He's not going to come in with a machete in most homes. That may happen. But more likely than not, more often than not, he's not, not going to come in some um, sensational manner. He's going to come through ignorance. And we see this, of course, in the last days. Laodicea, the people of the judgment, what does it say? They think they're rich and increase in goods and have need of nothing, and they knowest not their true condition. They're ignorant. Ignorance prevails in the last days. And so I hope and pray that we'll become a little bit more intelligent by the end of this presentation. 
satanic devices. The Bible says, lest Satan should get an advantage over us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So the reverse would be true. If we are ignorant of his devices, Satan should have an advantage over us. That's pretty commonsensical. And so we need to be aware of how the devil's moving. We're not trying to focus or glorify the devil, but we want to make sure we understand how is he operating? Why is he operating so that we can counter his offenses successfully? And Jesus, of course, says, if thy eye, I put an iPhone, because I think that's more uh, appropriate today, or else we'd have a lot of eyeless individuals walking around in the church. But if thy iPhone offend thee, cut it off. This is one of those devices that oftentimes is offending individuals. We need to make sure that if something has dominion or is in control of us, we can cut it off. We can cut it off. And that's the admonition so that we're not taken advantage of by the devil. So I want to preface this because sometimes we might think, well, Yafet, I've made mistakes. I've made, you know, are you blaming me? There's not, not, no condemnation here. We're just trying to establish the facts. Where are we in reality in these last days? How can we be true to the facts? But when we see where we are, I want to also insert this reminder. God is compassionate towards the ignorant. Bible says, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way for that he himself, our high priest, is also compassed with infirmities. He knows what it's like to walk in your shoes, friends. So he sympathizes with you. Trust in his merits, trust in his grace to sustain you. Now, this is a beautiful picture. I love this picture for many reasons. Number one, there's a little child. Uh, my parents had the privilege of uh, owning a daycare for um, a business for over 15 years, and it was a blessing. And I, I very much grew up around children. And children are so unique. Um, they come in all different shapes and sizes. Uh, and I've seen the best and the worst <laughs> of what children have to bring. But uh, one thing I really love about this picture is that not only is there a child, but you can see she's frolicking almost in the wind in the countryside, almost where she was designed to be. You can see in the country, the, gl the glistening blades of grass, the sunset or the sunrise, depending on what it is. You can see the fresh air. This is the environment that a child is to grow up in the school lesson book of nature. And we see a beautiful picture of what every child was designed to have. Uh, but very few obtain. And I also appreciate how she's dressed. You know, many parents are ignorant about how to dress their children. And uh, we see her clothed and in her right uh, standing and right mind. And we're really appreciative of parents who are, are not uh, ignorant on that fact. And those who are, we can always uh, take advantage of the grace of God to help us. Amen. But I really love this photo. It shows me how we can uh, really have a good start, a good set for our children uh, in life and to prepare them for the battles of life that they're going to be facing. Beautiful. Well, when we talk about children, we're actually talking about being like Christ. Satan hates anything that resembles the character of Christ. And children most closely reflect his image. Now, they're not perfect, okay? They will complain, they may be cranky, they may be a little bit selfish. But if you really analyze the character of these children, they actually, of all age groups, they most resemble the image of Jesus. And so Satan hates that image and he wants to destroy it as much as possible. Read this in the Gospels, but Jesus called unto them and said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, forbid them not, for of such, in other words, these are the kinds that make up the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. Again, Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst thereof. And said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted 
and become as little children. You shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Those are strong words, friends. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is great in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso, sh whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. You know, John the Baptist, he doubted Jesus when he was in prison, unfortunately, for just that, that weak, weak moment. He was uh, doubting and distrustful of God's plan that he had set up for him. And he sent his messengers to say, hey, you know, Lord, I'm in prison. And are, are you really the one or should we expect someone else? He's lost that childlike simplicity of faith. And what did Jesus say in response? He said to the crowd around him, he said, those who are the least in the kingdom of heaven are greater than John the Baptist. How can that be? I mean, this is the greatest of the prophets. Because anyone who has a childlike humility can be taught of God. They can be in a place where they can be converted. And we'll talk about more about what that means. You know, as one thing I've, I've lived, maybe you might say about half uh, average lifetime. And one thing I, I've observed very clearly is that the older one gets, the more knowledge they obtain, but the more susceptible they become to pride and self-sufficiency. Mm -hmm. You can read that in 1 Corinthians 8. It says, knowledge puffeth up, but love edifieth. And so I can't help but think that God has given us children to help us to remember what he wants us to be like, to be humble, to be more like Jesus. Mother and son, by beholding the simplicity, the self forgetfulness the confiding love of a little child are the attributes that heaven values these are the characteristics of real greatness you know that's a beautiful picture of her a mother with her child her son and you know as as you grow older you're more prone to these uh, uh self-elevation uh moments and you might have in your life as an adult we have children. Could it be? I was I was pondering this the other day with a fellow friend of mine. I said, maybe that's why God waits for us to be adults until we get children. Because by the time we reach adulthood, <laughs> we may be so full of self that we need children to remind us what we're actually supposed to be more like. And as, we, as we're taking care of them, we're beholding in them the image of God. Very interesting. But then you might think, well, what, ha what happens when they grow old? And they go and have their own children. Well, then you have grandchildren. <laughs> and then you can behold them. So that even as you grow old into a, a grandfather, grandmother, you can behold the image of Christ in your grandchildren. Amen? The Bible says, my favorite Bible character, Job 32, 8 to 9, it says, but there is a spirit in a man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Great men are not always wise, neither do the aged understand judgment. Just because someone has gray hairs doesn't mean that they understand. It doesn't mean that they're more like Jesus because of the time they've lived. It depends whether they've walked with Christ or not. And it's a, it would behoove us to benefit from the children around us to observe and by beholding will become changed. It's a beautiful thing to behold. And may this be a reminder for us as well on Mother's Day that we can look and acknowledge the face of Christ in these beautiful children that God has blessed us with. Not one of them is a mistake. True conversion. This is a principle that was so powerful to me. I hope that you'll, you'll take this and meditate on it. The Bible tells us in Matthew 13, he's quoting from Isaiah. He says, for these people's hearts talking about the church, is waxed, gross, hardened. And their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and should understand with their hearts. And what's the result? And be converted. Remember, unless you're like a child and converted. Once you get converted, What's the solution? What's the remedy? 
God says, then I can heal you. Then I can take you to where I want to, to go for your life. So there are steps here. Number one, the seeing of the eyes, the hearing of the ears, but the, those are just avenues to get to the soul to understand in the heart. And once you get the understanding in the heart, you can be converted and God can heal you. So we need to incline, like, like Proverbs says, incline thine ears and thine heart unto understanding. Apply thine heart unto wisdom. And God will then, in other words, humble thyself, right? Unless you humble, just what Jesus said, then God can teach us and we can be just like little children. You'll see the greatest examples in scripture. The things that God did the greatest through people was because they were like little children. Not too proud to walk with Jesus and to learn of him. Willful disregard of God's word results in a lack of knowledge, ignorance. And thus, even though they claim themselves to be wise, they can be ignorant. True understanding comes from God. And thus lost and unconverted condition. And then we can't perpetuate a safe condition or, a, or a, an influence of a safe condition to our children. And it's just perpetuated over and over again. We'll see there are two divides in history. One uh, goes to Jesus and his word. The other one goes to the devil and his deceptions. What about David and Solomon? How did they become great? What did they say? Surely I have behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned of his mother. My soul is even as a weaned child. And now, O Lord God, Solomon says, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David, my father, and I am but what? A little child. I mean, he was a grown adult at this time, but he recognized his need and submission to Jesus. I know not how to come in or to go out. Give therefore thy servant what? An understanding heart. He was converted. True conversion, true education. You see, friends, we have somehow, we've come to the condition where we believe that we can be safe in ignorance, that we can somehow combat the enemy's knowledge, and he's spewing out a whole lot of knowledge on his end, but that somehow as parents and as church in general, we can combat that knowledge with ignorance. It will never work. Never. It will, it will always end with failure. The way that we combat education is with education. The best way we're told is to combat falsehood is to present the truth. We fight fire with fire. And this is the example we see in Jesus. It's a beautiful chapter in Ministry of Healing, True Education. Jesus secured his education in the home. His, it doesn't say father, it says his mother. Now, mothers and fathers need to work together. But of the two, who has the greater influence? We're told that the mother, the work of childbearing, largely relies upon the mother. His mother was his first human teacher. From her lips and from the scrolls of the prophets, he learned of heavenly things. He lived in a peasant's home and faithfully and cheerfully acted his part in bearing household burdens. He who had been the commander of heaven was a willing servant, a loving, obedient son. He learned a trade and with his own hands worked in the carpenter's shop with Joseph. In the garb of, common, of a common labor, he walked the streets of the little town, going to and returning from his humble work. With the people of that age, the value of things was estimated by outward show. As religion had declined in power, it had increased in pomp. The educators of the time sought to command respect by display and ostentation. To all this, the life of Jesus presented a marked contrast. His life demonstrated the worthlessness of those things that men regarded as life's great essentials. The schools of his time, with their magnifying of things small and their belittling of things great, he did not seek. His education was gained from heaven-appointed sources. What are they? Number one, useful work. You don't need to go to an Ivy League school and spend $100,000 in debt 
to understand that. You just need useful labor. Number two, the study of the scriptures. It's available anywhere. Anywhere you go, the Bible is made plain for all to read. Number three, from nature. All you have to do is go outside to a park and lean, glean from the lessons of nature what God is trying to speak to us. Lastly, the experiences of life. These are God's lessons book, lesson books full of instruction to all who bring to them what? A willing hand, a seeing eye. Those are the avenues. And what? An understanding heart. We just read that in Matthew. Ears, eyes, understanding heart so that God can convert us and we can be healed. I write unto you, little children. We are referred to as children in the Bible. You might see this several times in Scripture as you read. Children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake, because you have known the Father. You know, these children are precious. They are very close to the heart of God, and God has forgiven them. The Bible says also in Luke 10, in that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent, those who are wise in their own eyes, and has revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected praise. So God's Praise the glory, give glory, fear God and give glory unto him. His everlasting gospel will be perfected through who? The young mouths, the young children who most resemble his character. So that the world can see the contrast between the children of light and the children of darkness. These are God's final weapons. A little child, a little one, the Bible pro prophesies in Isaiah, will become like a thousand, one in a thousand, a small one, a strong nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in his time. Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward as arrows in the hand of a mighty man. So are the children of the youth. So what is this saying? Arrows in the hand of a mighty man. Powerful. So this is saying that God's children are actually his weapons wherewith he will vindicate his character and disprove the claim, the false claims of the enemy. That God is unloving, that he's arbitrary, that he's untrustworthy, that his law cannot be kept. He will use children or childlike individuals. As the children sang in the temple courts, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So in these last days, children's voices will be raised to give the last message of warning to a perishing world. When heavenly intelligences see that men are no longer permitted to present the truth, the spirit of God will come upon the children. So the way of, of the adults will be hedged up they will be disallowed. There will be COVID-20 COVID laws or whatever they're going to call it to tell, to restrict God's people from preaching the truth. The children, and you know children, they're not afraid to say the truth, right? <laughs> and they will do a work in the proclamation of the truth, which the older workers cannot do because their way will be hedged up. Our church schools are designed and ordained by God to prepare the children for this great work. Here, children are to be instructed in the special truths for this time and in practical medical missionary work. God is going to use these young people, a generation at the end of time, the weakest mentally, physically, morally, spiritually, bankrupt, but God will raise up such a generation, a seed that will serve him so that he and he alone gets the glory. If we look in scripture, we're going to do a brief survey, survey here of scripture. And I want to take you through this study because it's profound 
And you might almost miss it if you don't read carefully and study carefully the scriptures. But there's always been two lines throughout the history of the great controversy between Christ and Satan. The seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. The former to forcefully controvert the word of God and the latter to vindicate it by representing Jesus in the life. We can see this in scripture. Psalms 22, 30, a seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. So there's going to be a seed, a generation of people that will look just like Jesus, that will vindicate his character before he comes. Isaiah 6 talks about, but yet in, in it, talking about God's people, shall be a tenth. It shall return or repent. That's the Old uh, Testament word, uh, Hebrew word shub, or to return to God. And shall be eaten as a teal tree and as an oak whose substance is in them. When they cast their leaves, so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. Paul actually talks, he understood this principle. Dealing with uh, separation and divorce, he, he says this little clause, he says, if a wife is a believer and the husband is not, the children are still holy. God is trying to preserve a holy line, a holy generation. You know, we've heard of bloodlines. Well, God has a holy bloodline. And it's a generation that passes on his character, reflected and taught over and over again, like a domino effect. And it's supposed to grow and swell until the whole earth is covered by the glory of Jesus as the waters cover the earth. And it's going to come to a showdown, friends. Revelation 12, 17, the dragon is going to be wroth with this seed, this generation. And he's going to go make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So why does Satan hate marriage so much? What is the purpose of marriage? If we fail to understand something's purpose, we'll inevitably, inevitably pervert its function. That's just common sense. So then what is the purpose of marriage in the plan of redemption? Marriage, well, let's, let's read the verse. God tells us, we don't have to guess. She thy companion and the wife of thy covenant, and did not he that is God make one, so the two shall be one flesh? Yet had he, God, the residue of the spirit, he retained the substance of what that marriage is. And why? Why one? What's the purpose of forming one? That he, that is God, might seek a godly seed, a seed that is God-like, a seed that looks just like Jesus. That's the purpose of marriage, friends. That's the primary chief reason why God forms two individuals together. And the reason why Satan hates marriage and is trying to destroy it and pervert it in every way possible is because he understands that this is the seed, this godly seed eventually that is the seed. Remember the seed of the woman, Genesis 3.15? Thy, thy head shall be bruised by the heel. And we'll actually read by not just Jesus. Yes, Jesus is going to do the crushing, but it's completed by the seed. And we're going to read that in, in uh, Romans 16, that crushing of the head of the serpent. And he does not want his head crushed. So as a result, he says, well, this is the institution this is the vehicle by which God will foment and produce a seed, a character generation that looks just like Jesus. I'm going to destroy it with everything I have. And he's done a very good job. He's done a very good job. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced, that's agricultural language. When it's reproduced in his people, seed saving, that's what... That's what marriage is. You you have that seed within you. You seed save, and then you reproduce. And you, the next generation saves, saves that seed, and you reproduce, 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 until you have a whole harvest that is ripe for Jesus. He'll come to claim them as his own. But now there's also another line. There's another lineage. And again, you might miss it if you don't read scripture carefully, but it's there. It's there. The Bible talks about the remnant that was slain by the sword that comes out of the, the mouth of the Lord. Uh, that's Revelation 19, 21. 
The Bible says that the field is the world in that parable of the seed and the sower. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are who? The children of the wicked one. There are children of Satan on this earth, friends. That's what the Bible teaches. The Bible says the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. Jesus said to those who were in the church, so these children of the devil can actually be in church. They can sit in your pews. You are of your father, the devil. In this, the children of God are manifest, the, and the children of who? The devil. Whosoever doth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. So we see clearly there's two lineages all throughout history. And it really began with Cain and Abel. And that lineage continues till this day. And it's going to come to a climax in the very near future. So, so God wants to see his image reflected. But you don't think Satan has a phone. Give me a Give me a chemo. Give me a Allowance. Can we get someone to please uh, mute their microphone? Please and thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. So Satan also wants his image to be reflected. Just like God does. Both are going to be reflected in the last days. We have this powerful quotation. Review and Herald, 1814, 1896, paragraph 7. Through yielding to satanic influences, men will be transformed into fines, just as at his first coming. And those who were created in the image of God, who were formed to honor and glorify their creator, will become the habitation of dragons, that great dragon, the serpent of old, the devil and Satan. And Satan will see in an apostate race his masterpiece of evil. What is it? Men who reflect his own image. I don't, I don't want to see that, friends. I just don't even want to see it. I want to be like Jesus. Amen? So what are some of the ways that the devil has, he sees this lineage, he sees this pure, undefiled, holy line that's pure that God is trying to preserve until he can get that harvest. So the serpents, the devil, the enemy says, wait a minute, if I can cross the line and enter into that lineage, if I can't beat him, I'll join him. Mingling with the seed of men. We see this all throughout scripture as well. In the days of uh, Ezra, after the Babylonian captivity, they began to do this immediately. When they first came in the second, the first time to the Holy Land, the Promised Land, boom! Next thing you know, a couple generations go by, and they can't they can't continue without mingling with the women, and their seed, the Holy Line, was tainted with immorality. They they swerved from their allegiance to Jehovah. Same thing when they left Babylon to go back and rebuild. Same thing, Holy Seed mingled themselves they took daughters for themselves and for their sons so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands now i just want to preface this um some people you know advocate the um uh the lineage based on the, the holy lineage uh, i don't i don't want to be misunderstood okay uh the holy lineage is not talking about a genetic lineage um, and I don't have time to go through it. Go, th go to Galatians. You'll see in Galatians chapter 2, Romans chapter 2, those are Romans 9. These are great places to understand that the seed that, that Christ is referring to, as we can see in the genealogy of Christ, is not so much genetic. It is not ethnic. It is not a people group. Although there was for many centuries a people group who had the oracles of God, the is or Israelites. Um, you know, there are... Uh, a modern modern day movement of Hebrew Israelites today uh, claiming that you know if you are from such and such a African nation then you are the lost tribes of the of the house of Israel I don't buy into that at all if you read scripture carefully the holy seed that the Bible is talking about is a spiritual lineage you are Abraham's seed and heirs of the promise if you have faith in Jesus and you obey his law so I just want to clarify that for those who might misconstrue uh, my my message here so continuing on, so that the Holy Seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hands of the princes and rulers have been chief in this trespass. Just before the flood, same thing. And it caused such a wickedness that God had to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to restart. 
restart this whole humanity thing. They are so wicked. And how did it come about? Because the holy line mingled with the unholy line. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God thought... If we could, if we could make, if everyone could make sure they're muted, that would be very helpful. I appreciate it. I'm sure it's not on purpose. Yeah, brother Andre, we love you, brother. We just ask if you can please, everyone can mute. That would be fantastic. Thank you kindly. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, so they were looking by their eyes. And they took them wives of all which they chose. Once you had that mingling, it was it it tainted that holy seed. Bible says again, Paul reminding us, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. So what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? There's other examples we could we could name. We don't have time. Solomon took on many wives, right? What did they do? They turned his heart from serving God. The elders of Israel on the plains of Moab, same thing. Samson, he had a love for other women, right? She pleaseth me well. My delight is in her. Mm -hmm. And what did it do to Samson? He drew his heart away. We cannot afford to taint that holy lineage, friends. We need to preserve our seed. Now, this is interesting. If you go through scripture, you'll find that God does not take this lightly when we abuse children. <clears throat> I want to show to you very quickly an example of this. The Bible says in Exodus 23, 7, keep thee far from a false matter and the innocent and righteous slay thou not, for I will not justify the wicked. There was a king named Manasseh. He was the longest living king from my knowledge. And he was the wickedest king of all the kings of Israel and Judah. And it says, this king reigned at 12. He reigned for 55 years. But notice it mentions something. It says his mother's name was Hepzibah. I don't know if I said that right. Hepzibah. And so what does that mean? I looked it up. It means my delight oh, is okay. in her. <laughs> I don't know if you can make, if you can manually uh, mute everyone, Sister Natasha, that would be amazing. I think you should have the ability to do that. That way we don't have to. I don't think I do, but I think if you can manually mute everyone, that would be amazing. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Yes, uh, I've done that. My apologies. Uh, no worries. You're good. Okay, so so here it says Hepsipa means my delight is in her. Now, why does the Bible why does the Bible bother to mention the mother's name? Why not the father's name? Because the mother has the greatest influence. You know, there's a there's a chapter in the great controversy when the whole controversy is ended and the desolation of the earth takes place and hellfire breaks forth. Well, Sister White mentions a couple of people's names. One is Nero. We know King Nero, uh, Caesar Nero is going to be in hell. We know that. But it says he was there and influenced largely as a result of the influence of his mother, of his mother. How important it is, whether it be fathers or mothers, that we have a right influence on our children, on the seed. We're developing, we're cultivating, we're fertilizing, we're watering, we're giving proper warmth, sunlight to our children so that they can grow and flourish and bear fruit to God's glory. Otherwise, we see the terrible results of poor parenting. Moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another. Beside his sin, wherewith he made Judah to sin in doing that, which was evil in the sight of the Lord, he made his sons pass through the fire. Child sacrifice. 
Surely at the commandment of the Lord came this upon Judah. Talking about when, when Babylon came to destroy Israel. It said to remove them out of his sight. Why? Because of the sins of Manasseh. According to all that he did. And also for the innocent blood that he shed. For he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood. Which the Lord will not pardon. Listen, when we get to the place that we are willing to tolerate the abuse of children, God says this far and no further. Even after, you know who the grandson of Manasseh was? It was Josiah. No king served the Lord with all his heart, not even David, who did not turn to the right or to the left. He reformed Israel. He went back to the Bible. But God said, listen, I'll delay it for your sake. But because of what Manasseh did, I cannot prevent this from coming. It has to be meted out. God does not mess around with children. Now, is there another woman whose everyone is delighting in her, who's called the mother of harlots? And is she drunk with blood? In Revelation 17, we see, this is a symbol, of course, of an institution. I saw a woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. This is a little tidbit of what's going to be coming shortly. So what is Satan's strategy? We see the two lines. We've, we've seen clearly that the Holy Scripture mentions this. We understand this is a war. This is an all-out battle. We have to be intentional about this. The enemy is a strategist. He's a tactful general. He works in a very precise manner. And he works, of course, through the children of wickedness. Well, this man, who I'm fully convinced is a children of wickedness, um, as you'll see, they have worked, these, these technocrats, these oligarchs have worked in so insinuous a matter to create conditions in this world that will not replicate and further the character of Jesus, but will replicate and further the character of Satan to weed out all the holy seed. Notice what he, re he says here. This is a man named Bertrand Russell, a sociologist, so-called so sociologist, in his book, The Impact of Science and Society. He says the following. It is to be expected that advances in physiology and psychology will give governments much more control over individual mentality than they now ha have even in totalitarian countries. Feech, talking about Frederick Neat Feech, which uh, this, this man was a complete um, anti-God in every way uh, and carried out Jesuit theology in his own right. It says, Feech la laid it down that education, the false kind that is, should aim at destroying free, free will. What well, God's education is so that we should in, think and act independently. That's what God wants us to do. But in the, in the unholy line, it's destroy free will, control mechanism. So that after pupils have left school, they shall be incapable throughout the rest of their lives of thinking or acting otherwise than as their schoolmasters would have wished. But in his day, this was unattainable ideal. What he regarded as the best system in ex existence produced Karl Marx. So now we know where communism came from. In future, now he's writing in 1952. In future, such failures are not likely to occur where there is dictatorship. Do we see in Revelation 13 a coming dictatorship? Yes or no? Yes. What are the means that they're going to bring this about? They tell us. Number one, diet. Do we have a health message? Have we been told we are to ch change the diets of our families and children so they will affect the mind in such a way that we can produce a generation, a holy line? The enemy knows this as well. There's a diet for each lineage. So through diet, what else? Injections. 
What do we see children getting from, from their first day of birth, even prenatally? Vaccinations. And if you've done any amount of research in that area, if you've seen some of my past lectures, you know they are definitely of the devil. Um, everything that you can find imaginable is found in these disgusting agents to, to control the mind and even perpetuate illness. The third thing is injunctions or false education. These three things will combine. Now notice from a very early age, the devil knows you have to start young. You have to start when they're small. He's not, he's not aiming for the 20 year olds or the, the 16 year olds. He's aiming for when they're young. For what purpose? Notice to produce the sort of character. They're intentional about it. They know what they're doing. And they're doing a good job. Where are God's people trying to do the same thing, but for the holy lineage to produce a character and the sort of beliefs that God considers desirable instead of the authorities? And any serious criticism of the powers that be will become psychologically impossible. Even if all are miserable, all will believe themselves happy because the government will tell them that they are so. This man is sick and he's sick minded, but he's controlled by the devil. And this is what the enemy wants for you so that you are tossed to and fro at his will. But God came to set you free so you can have true education and perpetuate that to continue a holy line for you and for your family. The Luciferian tactic, Isaiah 14. Satan coveted the power. I will be like the most high. He wanted to be the image of God, but not in character. Christ, on the other hand, in Philippians 2, humbled himself, even the point of death he took on the cross. The most heinous, mag uh, malicious death he could possibly have. Ignominious death he could have on the cross for you and I. Both Satan and Christ utilize the power of force. The difference is the driving motive. In Christ's case, it's the love of Christ that compels us. In the enemy's case, it's hatred and pride and self-sufficiency. So we see a spectrum here. Love without free will is no love at all. We are who we are when no one is looking. And so are we truly selfish? On one end, you have pure selfishness, Satan. On the other end, you have all Christ, which is selflessness and all love. Which one are we? There are prenatal influences that we need to be aware of that go to the third and fourth generation. And parents need to be aware of this. Uh, in uh, this book, Solemn Appeal, great resource for young couples or married couples to, to uh, read, because this is one of the avenues that Satan is molding the character. I won't read the whole thing here, but it says passion may be found as base a quality in the marriage relation as outside of it. The character thus acquired by parents is transmitted to the children. Remember, seed saving. And they come into the world with their moral powers weakened and the lower passions predominant. The gross passions of the parents are perpetuated in the children. And he, that is the devil, knows too that in no way can he better stamp his own hateful image upon their character. He, he wants his image reflected, friends. The devil wants it. So he knows he wants to stamp his character on the offspring. How can he do that? And that he can thus mold their characters even more readily than he can the character of the parents. The parents, we need to be self-controlled in every aspect of life. Even the prenatal influences. It was interesting. James White is, has record, is recorded as saying that when husband engages with his wife while she's pregnant, it can actually stimulate unnaturally the animal passions in the child when he's born. Interesting. In fact, we have the example of Joseph and Mary. If you read carefully, God said, don't touch her until she's born. And you read the account, it says Jesus, it says Jesus was first born before Joseph knew his wife, Mary. It says he knew her not until Jesus was born. So for nine months, he had abstained even while married. Very interesting principle 
they are thought to to uh, to show. But the principle is self control, every aspect of life, because it's not just you. Remember, you have influence on the children that are beholding you. Nine tenths of the afflictions of gynecological problems are because of what? Husbands of women in the bedrooms, their coarse animal treatment. The whole human structure is ruined. The result is suffering and terrible disorder. God is calling us to self-control. Remember, it starts, we're trying to understand the principles. I think of this as a GMO seed. Satan is trying to get us to produce GMO seeds, genetically modified organisms, and spraying them with spiritual roundup. So that when they grow, they'll be resistant to the influences of God. And they'll be choked by the, the weeds of life, the trials of life. And they'll be just tears that will be bound up and, and, and sent to the fire. So friends, we need to be aware of this. We're not condemning, we're educating. We want us not to be ignorant. We want us to be intelligent. Amen? Amen. So what can we do for children? How do we educate them? Well... We need to be careful not to overexpose children unnecessarily or prematurely to the fruit of the knowledge of evil. However, there's an awareness on sexual matters that should be made plain according to the age of appropriateness. The Bible says in Deuteronomy, teach, not keep them ignorant. Please, please don't keep them ignorant because they're not going to be ignorant. They're going to learn from the world. Teach them diligently. Teach them diligently, Deuteronomy says. On every matter, and you can see those. One of those issues was their sexual uh, being, um, uh, proper touch, and all of these um, social relations. It's in there. It's it's there in Leviticus. It's there in the Old Testament. We need to teach them. Those children of Israel who went into the Promised Land were not ignorant as to why those who were in uh, the land of Canaan were driven out. They knew exactly why. And so we need to be intelligent on these things. Uh, the Bible says, I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. So we need to be careful not to overexpose them, but it is important that we educate them in the right lines. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan. Remember in Genesis 3, thy head shall bruise his heel. So in other words, Satan's head was begun to be crushed at Calvary, at Golgotha, the crushing of the head. But that's actually going to be, it says shall, that's future tense. Paul is writing to the church. To, to who? Those who are simple concerning evil. Those who are childlike. Those are the ones who are going to crush Satan under their feet shortly. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, that you stir up nor awaken my love until he please. There's a time to love and there's a time to hate. So we need to understand when that time is. Well, we were made for pleasure, friends. I want to make it very clear. We need to teach our children that Eden, which means pleasure, is what God desires for us. Favorite Bible character, Elihu, he says, if they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasure. God has no problem with you having pleasure. He designed you for pleasure. That will show me the path of life in thy presence is the fullness of joy and at thy right hand are pleasures evermore. I think one of the reasons why we're so uh, restricted in helping our children to understand these principles, because sometimes our parents, we ourselves are, are still shackled in shame, maybe because of our own past or what we're going through now. And, and we can't help those who are under us if we ourselves haven't been unshackled, right? So we have to understand, what does the Bible actually teach about this? You know, the Bible te it has everything that we need for life and godliness. The Bible says rivers of pleasure. <laughs> you know, when I think of rivers of pleasure, does holy scenes come into your mind? But because the world has so tainted the imagination, this is why. But if you read scripture, there's nothing wrong with it. We need to have the right understanding of what true pleasure is. Pleasure in doing God's will. Therefore, I take pleasure. What did Paul say? In infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. God wants you to have pleasures evermore. He just wants you to have his kind because he knows his way is the best fulfilling way. How early should we train our children? Well, according to Kellogg uh, in The Man, the Masterpiece, you have puberty for children 
uh, who are female, about 16 to 20, men 18 to 24. But unfortunately, friends, today, the average age of exposure to sexual material is like eight years old. So you can't wait until then. Um, we need proactive and not passive parenting. Those, those days of passive parenting, like, I don't know, we'll just maybe, you know, hope and pray for the best, cross our fingers. That's never going to produce that lineage that we need to vindicate God's character. We need proactive parents now. And there's a principle in the Bible that God, the heavenly parent, uses, and it's called Emmanuel. God with us. God is with us. He's not apart from us. He's with us. He's in our lives, teaching us, molding us, shaping us, educating us, living life with us rather than being apart from us. A little history of child sexual abuse. The first sexual laws in place against child abuse were in 1965. So um, quite a while until this was actually legislated. But uh, 74, you had the coined term child sexual abuse. One in six men have been sexually abused, and that's a conservative number. One in three women. 60% of sexually abused children survivors are left with some type of impairment ranging from mild to severe effects and potential long-standing consequences. So this is not a small issue. This is something we need to be aware of so that we can prevent as much as is possible uh, the repercussions. Uh, Dr. Carnes, he is kind of the uh, secular uh, who's who when it comes to uh, sex addiction. And Dr. Patrick Carnes says in his research, he revealed that 97%, almost 100% of male sexual addicts had a history of emotional abuse, not getting that, having that father wound, for, for instance, or some kind of emotional distance in the home. According to Doug Carpenter, who wrote a beautiful book, I actually have it here with me, um, Secret Shame. I'm always reading, so this has been my latest read, uh, Secret Shame. A Survivor's Guide to Understanding Male, Male Sexual Abuse and Male Sexual Development, very much recommended uh, by PhD uh, psychologist, Dr. Doug Carpenter. He says 90% of abusers are people who actually you know. It's not strangers. Stranger danger does exist, but that is not the primary uh, source of abuse. He also showed that in his, in his book, Secret Shame, that male victims typically hold onto secret shame for an average of 25 years, that's a quarter of a century, before disclosing their abuse. How sad. We should have such a relationship with our parents, with our mothers, that whatever may happen, that they will be able to disclose those things. Amen? ACEs, adverse childhood events. These ACEs create negative behavioral patterns in life and actually can lead to things like suicide. Um, and there's, there's connection to pornography as well. Based uh, on available data, the likely age of a child's first exposure to pornography is around tween years. The majority of kids are exposed to porn by 13, with some exposed as young as seven. Remember that age seven, according to a survey in 2020. A national representative estimate of US youth exposed to pornography, 84% were males, 57% females right? 60% of 10 and 11 year olds have smartphones. So is it really any surprising that sometimes they encounter porn online, whether they're looking for it or not? So again, be, be intelligent. Don't be ignorant of these things, uh, fathers and mothers. Child guidance. Now remember that word seven, too much importance cannot be placed on the early, early training of children the lessons that the child learns during the first seven years of life have more to do with the forming of his character, that seed, than all that it learns in future years. And how easy, how often we see these years squandered in front of a television or iPad, squandered in a daycare giving them up to be trained by someone else for most of the day. It is our high time to train up our seed after us. Amen. Dr. Folletti and Kaiser Permanente, this is a man who actually came up with the ACEs term. And uh, he found that there was brain development issues, social, emotional, and cognitive difficulties. Uh, he says, in closing our, uh, in his remarks, he says, our study of the relationship 
of adverse childhood experiences to adult health status in over 17,000 persons shows addiction to be a readily understandable, although largely unconscious attempt to gain relief from well-concealed prior life traumas by using psychoactive materials. Adverse childhood experiences are the greatest unaddressed public health threat facing our nation today. You know, how many, how many individuals go to drug addiction or spiritualism or yoga or any kind of transcendental meditation, just trying to escape when in reality, it's an unconscious attempt to gain relief from these prior traumas, the things that we've gone through that need to be rightly addressed. We need to bring it to the light, amen? We can address it. So there's a vicious cycle. The vicious cycle starts with sin, various forms of, of abuse. That inevitably leads to shame. The shame then is tied to a hiding, a secrecy. That's what shame does. And then, and then, then and then, then hiding, you you need a coping mechanism to deal with the, the 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 concealment. And then, if we don't get healed from that, guess what? We replicate the abuse in others, and it just goes on and on and on and on. This is the vicious cycle. Carpenter, uh, again, shame is the core pathology for many mental health issues. Shame can drive a man to isolate himself from relationships that could bring the healing. You see, friends, we're healed in community. And so what shame does is it brings us into isolation, which is separate from relationships, the love that we need, that would actually bring the healing. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So we have to break that mold of shame so that we can then not be isolated so that we can have relationships that we can then what? Have understanding and be converted in Christ and heal us. Parents must understand, he goes on, parents must understand that sex education is not a one-time discussion, but multifaceted, multi-layered conversation that begins early in life. Remember, the devil is starting early, right? From a very early age. Is that what we read? Well, we need to start from a very early age by teaching children about their bodies, you know, body, just naming body parts. It's okay. We talk about the nose. We talk about the, the chest. We can talk about, there's no dirty part of a body's, a person's body. Every whit of them is holy and consecrated for a particular function and purpose. And they need to be educated what that function and purpose is age appropriately about their bodies and toddlers and, and imparting progressively more age-appropriate information throughout the developmental process. If the foundation for an open, positive relationship and conversation has been laid, a child will feel more comfortable approaching a parent with questions and comments. To survive the abuse, the mind works to suppress and potentially repress the knowledge and the memory of the abuse. This is the natural mechanism of the mind. It's how the, work, the mind works. This process can result in either partial or complete traumatic amnesia. It is e easier to forget than live with the knowledge of traumatic pain. Survival trumps trauma. This has been on the rise recently. It's called SSA, sibling sexual abuse. In other words, the perpetrators are, are, are their peers, other children. This is what the en enemy wants. And this is where they were in Sodom and Gomorrah. The children were themselves the abusers. They were the, the, the majority of perpetration of abuse on other children. One in, tell, in 10 children engage in some type of sexual exploitation, exploration with another child, and up to 25% of boys may experiment with same-aged peers. Mothers, you cannot be too careful in preventing your children from learning low habits. It is easier to learn evil than to eradicate it after it is learned. Neighbors may permit their children to come into your house to spend the evening and the night with your children. Here is a trial and a choice for you, right? Oh, I, I don't want to be disrespectful to run the risk of offending your neighbors by sending their children to their own home or gratify them and let them lodge with, with your children and thus expose them 
to be instructed in that knowledge, which would be a lifelong curse to them. To save my children, this is Ellen White speaking, to save my children from being corrupted, I have not allowed them to sleep in the same bed or in the same room with other boys. And have, as on occasion has required when traveling, made a scanty bed upon the floor for them rather than have them lodge with others. Friends, this is this is key. I mean, you might say, well, this is extreme, Yafet. It's not really extreme when you realize the repercussions that one exposure can have on a life. I don't know if we can play this. I don't think it has the capacity, but we'll try. I want to just show you a glimpse. This is a small glimpse of what does the enemy, because if you don't educate your children, the enemy will. What does the enemy have in place for One your moment, child? brother Yafet. If when you went to share screen, if you clicked, um, there's a little button that says sound. Yes. Did you do that? I did not. <laughs> okay. Do, nope. do that for the sound to come through. How can I? Do I have to unshare and then share again? Yes. Unshare. Okay. okay. Let me stop sharing. Go then... to share again. And before you click on the screen you want to share, there's a. Did you see it? Got it. It's in the lower left hand corner, a small box. I got it. Thank you for that. Um, I need to make sure I have this. This is not my computer. Pray for me, guys. Let me see if I can see. Okay. Let's see if this works. Okay. Maybe we're, we're not going to do the. Oh, please. This is not my computer, and so I'm borrowing someone's, and it may not work as planned. Okay, let's see if it'll work now. It works. This is definitely an attack. It will affect your child rearing. It will affect your education system. This is instructions for the teacher in the classroom to ask her or his students, how do people express their sexual feelings? What is abstinence? And here are some answers. Oral sex, masturbation, anal sex, massage, holding hands, touching each other's genitals, saying, I like you. And what they're doing is equating all these things. Saying, I like you, is equal to anal sex. It is pornography. Men, especially on the house floor, did not want to look at. We couldn't show this on the television news, but yet we want our fourth grade children to be looking at this book. In the name of sexuality education, children are seeing obscene materials that have been ruled by Congress and by the Supreme Court impossible to show to children. An online CSE program for African youth called The World Starts With Me tells children that sexuality includes oral sex and masturbation. It then tells them it's their own choice if they want to lose their virginity. It shows children pictures of naked girls and boys in various stages of development and then asks them to point out differences in their private parts. Parents likely will never know as it is all done online away from home. They have elementary students as young as nine years old. Then they teach them how to wear a condom. And they have this plastic genitalia, and they even have uh, young girls. They're teaching them how to put a condom on a male genitalia and boys how to put a condom on a woman genitalia without the knowledge and consent of the parents. They're giving them handouts, negotiating sexual encounters with other students. For example, there are statements like this. Can I take your shirt off? It makes me hot when you touch me here. Is it okay if I take my pants off? Where we in Latin America, we still have a lot of poverty. We have communities that don't have fresh water, that don't have electricity. Focus is completely shifted from basic needs. They get a comprehensive sexual education without the consent of parents, taking and deconstructing the family. My brother Luigi and I had an opportunity to go to the United Nations 
and give a speech on the UN floor. I told them how Planned Parenthood was passing out a booklet for HIV positive youth at the United Nations called Healthy, Happy and Hot. This is for the kids who have AIDS. It teaches about sexual pleasure through masturbation with same-sex partners and even if you are drunk. This pamphlet called Healthy, Happy and Hot tells young people that you have the right not to disclose your HIV status to a sexual partner if you're not comfortable. It also tells young people that are HIV positive that if they decide with their partner not to wear a condom, that's their decision. The World Health Organization standards for sexuality education in Europe actually suggest that children ages zero to four should be given information about masturbation and given the right to explore their gender identity. For ages four to six, children should be taught about same-sex relationships and respect for different norms regarding sexuality. The interests of organizations like UNFPA and IPPF is to get parents out of the picture and to radicalize and sexualize children. UNFPA has tried to convince my country to change our positions on issues such as reproductive rights and comprehensive sexuality education. Madam Chair, does the UNFPA think it can do this because Nauru is the smallest member state of the United Nations? The Nigerian government was actually told by the Western countries that if they do not give in, that they will be denied foreign aid. On page 89 of a UNICEF-published Sexual and Reproductive Health Manual, UNICEF listed situations in which one can obtain sexual pleasure that included sexual responses directed towards inanimate objects, animals, minors, and non-consenting persons. In the context of the Sustainable Development Goals that determines the agenda for the next 15 years, the voice is very, very biased. It's just International Planned Parenthood Federation and their affiliates. We have a direct influence on the outcome documents, on what, what is established, what is negotiated at the UN. Some of the objectives of the UNESCO Sexuality Education Guidelines include teaching children at age nine about sexual stimulation and the definition and function of orgasm, and at age 15, that both men and women can receive sexual pleasure with a partner of the same or opposite sex. The It's All One curriculum, also promoted by International Planned Parenthood, reveals the multiple manipulative tactics used to indoctrinate and sexualize children through CSE. Like other CSE programs, it's all one claims, among other things, to be evidence-based, comprehensive, human rights, gender-sensitive, and culturally appropriate education that will increase young people's responsible decision-making to reduce adolescent rates of pregnancy and sexually transmitted infections, including HIV. It's all one, however, like most CSC programs, is really just cleverly disguised abortion rights, sexual pleasure education masquerading as human rights, gender, and sexual and reproductive health education. It aggressively promotes abortion with over 112 references to abortion. It's all one has an obsessive focus on sexual pleasure, mentioning sexual pleasure 62 times. It promotes multiple sex acts and instructs children on how to stimulate themselves or their partner to orgasm. To explore their readiness, children fill out a worksheet that infers children are ready to have sex when you are feeling sexually attracted to the other person and when you're feeling comfortable about telling the other person what feels good sexually. It teaches that human rights encompass sexual rights, including alleged rights to all persons to sexual expression and the right to seek sexual pleasure. Hooking children on sex is a multi-billion dollar business for Planned Parenthood and other similar organizations. This is because children or prospects, once sexualized, become Planned Parenthood customers dependent upon their services. Comprehensive sexuality education programs are disguised under many names. They may be called Comprehensive Sex or Sexual Education, Education on Human Sexuality, Reproductive Health Education, Information on Sexual and Reproductive Health, Family Life Education, Teen Pregnancy Prevention, Rape Prevention, anti-bullying programs, HIV AIDS prevention, and sometimes even abstinence or abstinence plus education. 
CSE programs usually falsely claim to be age-appropriate, evidence-based, healthy sexuality education that will prevent teen pregnancy, sexual abuse, STDs, and HIV. One of the handouts that concerns me the most is called the gender-bred person. They teach that gender is a spectrum, that you can choose to be whatever you want. You could be all female one day, and the next day feel like you're neither female or male. Frankly, it's confusing. It's a mental molestation. We're confusing these kids as to what they are. From a medical perspective, when sexual freedom is the priority, then sexual health is gonna suffer. There are laws in Oregon where children as young as 15 can get taxpayer-funded sex changes without parental consent. You can't have an aspirin at school without parental consent. However, a student could make these life-altering, permanent decisions without their parental knowledge or consent. Sexual rights, sexual education movements began with Dr. Alfred C. Kinsey. Kinsey actually had pedophiles measure with a stopwatch how many children could achieve what he called orgasms within a 24-hour period. Today, comprehensive sexuality education is based on this philosophy that children are sexual from birth, created by Kinsey. Say not to CSC! Say not to CSC! We've got to stop it. We've got to use everything at our disposal. We have to stand together to stop this attack against our children. And they have all this funding and this organization, but we know that if we stand together, we can do something for the family, for the children. We stopped the Kinsey Sexuality Education Program in Croatia. It is time for parents to say, no, my family is mine. My wife is mine. I am hers. Our children are ours. Band it together and find ways to stop it from entering your country. Men have to rise up, defend their family. On matters sexual, the fathers have got to stand up. Say, you have no place talking sexuality to my children. We resist it, even with our lives, because that's what life is all about. It's happening on our watch. If we don't do something about it, it is all of us that carry that guilt. To learn more and to sign the petition to stop comprehensive sexuality education, go to stopcse.org. Together, we can and will protect the world's children. Okay, wow, so that was a little bit longer than I thought, but I, th I think it got the, the message across. Um, we see, I'm not gonna go into detail, into some of these things that were mentioned, you know, child trafficking, abortion, pedophilia is on the, the normalization of pedophilia is becoming more prominent in the media now. And again, this is a sign of the times. In the days of Lot, and Sodom, and Gomorrah, Noah, when, when the abuse reached to the point of children and children abusing other children, this, the cry, it says, reached up to heaven. And there's, an, there's only one other time I can think of when that actually happens, and that's in the last days. Sexual molestation by Catholic priests is one of the most monumental global social issues at this time in history. On August 14, 2018, a grand jury in Pennsylvania released the report admitting that they had never seen anything on the scale as it related to child sexual abuse. Now, every church... Every church is, is guilty of this, but none so much as the Catholic Church. Bishopaccountability.org estimates that Roman Catholic Church has paid out more than $3 billion from 1950 to 2012, an estimated 16,000 victims. You know, Jesus gives this warning, friends, and he gives us a warning in love. And I was reading this, and something struck me. It says, Matthew 18, 6 and 7. It says, but whoso shall offend one of these little ones, vulnerable, which believe in me. What does he say? He uses an analogy. He says it were better for him that a millstone, now millstones are pretty heavy, were hanged about his neck 
and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father, which is in heaven. And I was thinking one day, Millstone, why does that sound familiar? It was bothering me for some time. And then all of a sudden I remembered, I've heard of that phrase before, millstone, depths of the sea. Where have I heard this? And then it clicked. Revelation chapter 18. There's another time in history where the sins of God's people reach so high an extent that heaven itself was alarmed. And notice what language was used. Does God notice this? Is he indifferent to this? You can even read it in your own Bible. Revelation 18. Revelation chapter 18. Talking about the fall of Babylon. It says, And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea. God sees the abuse that's taking place in the church against our little ones. Thus with violence, he says, shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more. The millstone, the sound of the millstone shall no more be heard at all in thee. Amazing. And it talks about how they actually have dealt, if you read this chapter, and how they dealt with the souls of men. And that they slayed the prophets of old as well. And so, friends, I think it's time that we recognize the hour that we're, we're in which we're living. And uh, we need to do our part in recompensing true justice in our sphere. And one, one of the best ways to do that is to educate. You fight fire with fire, false education with true education. And so my hope and my prayer is that this will be a wake-up call for mothers and for fathers, for future fathers and mothers. The devil is not playing any less hard than he used to play. He's playing harder. He's pushing it harder. And so we need to do our diligence because these children are precious. They are given to us in trust that we will raise them up. We've been given the blueprint. Raise them for me, he says, so that I can see my image reflected in these little ones who are so susceptible. They're moldable, they're pliable, they're, they're imprintable. You can give them your stamp of character if you educate them the right way. And I want to end, end with this. This is a promise that we can take to the heart. It says in Isaiah 11, when all this is done and over and every last child abuse case has been resolved and judgment has been rightfully meted out. It says, the suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the wheeled, weaned child shall put his hand on the cock cockatrice den. You know, right now, if you do that, you might get bitten if you put your hand there, but not so in the time to come. Safety for all children. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, that serpent of old will be destroyed. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the bullock. And dust shall be the serpent's meat. And a little child the Bible says, shall lead them. A little child shall lead them. 
amazing. Now, this was interesting to me because I thought, wait a minute, in Eden restored, everything's going to be back to the way it was. And the curse upon the serpent to eat the dust was after it had been used by the enemy. But here it says, dust shall be the serpent's meat. And I thought to myself, wait a minute. God is trying to tell us something here. The lion, the lamb, the wolf, they're going to go back and vegetarian. They're going to be eating the straw uh, just like every other vegetarian. But the serpent will not go back. It will remain in the condition that God pronounced it because that serpent is representative of Lucifer. Dust shall be the serpent's meat throughout all eternity. He will be humbled into the ground. Amen? This is a beautiful reminder of how God resolves the great controversy. And everything is restored back to its original condition where every child can be safe where we don't have to worry about abuse anymore or the repercussions thereof. So my prayer, friends, that this has been a blessing to you. I thank you for joining and, and staying with me. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm sure Sister Natasha would be happy to uh, take those later um, or depending on whether we have time. But I just want to say a close word of prayer at this time, okay? Father in heaven, I just want to thank you so much that you've been given to us this natural word that you've entrusted with us the word of god that is so intrinsic to life that we can we can take it we can assimilate it we can make the seed which is the word of god dwell in our hearts by faith and then lord we can perpetuate that in our children we can allow for us to bear fruit to your glory and hold lord how we want to see that generation that remnant, that seed of the woman to crush the seed of the serpent. And Lord, we're coming to that time very quickly. We pray for those parents who are in a crisis mode. We pray for those who may have made mistakes. Maybe they've been ignorant, but Lord, help them to see your compassion for them and how you will help direct and guide as much as you possibly can so that you can mold, even if it's just by prayers, the children that you've entrusted to us so that we can train them right and that we can have a generation that will finally finish this work. We're tired of talking about it. We want to see that generation. And so help us, Father, to this end is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And here are some resource links. If you want, you can feel Amen. free. There's just a couple, um, but you can feel free to take uh, those and and yeah, you know work with that i don't think there are any particularly uh in our church or maybe child impact might might be uh, associated with the sda church in particular but um you can feel free to take those down and and explore more about how to resolve these kinds of issues as well if they crop up in your life or someone else's life as well so that's enough uh talking for me i'll just hand it over to natasha now let me stop share Thank you, Brother Yafet. That okay. was very sobering, very powerful. Um, there's so much that could be said, but I'm going to pause and um, allow people to ask questions. Um, there was a question in the chat before you got started. Someone had to leave, mm -hmm. and they wrote how do you overcome all the trauma caused during childhood so um you know that so i would say the first thing is to um find someone that because sometimes it, de it depends on what kind of trauma and, and to what extent you know we we never take that lightly that's very um that's very serious um so we want to acknowledge that I think um and uh, also get get someone that you 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 believe can help um even if it's just a trusted um health professional or someone that you believe can uh have more experience or is more mature in this arena than you 
um, a pastor maybe or a friend, uh, you want to bring things to the light. A lot of the times we don't find the healing because it's it's kept in dark, right? So, you know, that that's a huge question. Um, and there are resources for, for that. And I mean, it depends on what, what kind of trauma, again, it, it depend on how you approach it. I mean, there's so, it's so varied, but um, in general, bring things to the light and um, expose what you're going through. You know, if you have a wound, what are we told? You know, it's almost like I've gotten to the point where I do the opposite of what the world says. Uh, we're told if you have a scratch, you know, cover it and, you know, the wound, cover that wound with a bandaid. That's absolutely one of the worst things you could do. I mean, in general, depending on the circumstance, but I have found that if you expose the wound to the sunlight, expose it to fresh air, invigorating air, you can actually begin a healing process that you would hinder or greatly diminish if you were covering it. And we have spiritual band-aids that we try to cover our wounds with. And so my encouragement is for you to expose those wounds that God may uh, help heal them in his time and in his way. Thank you. I'm struck by true education versus false education and how um, we as parents must be so intentional mm -hmm. right now with the present assault that's coming on Oh, yes. Children in schools, families, internet, I said iPhone, like this is nothing to be played with. No, 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 no. No more than if there was a fire in your home or a fire on the stove. You wouldn't just, not, not even a fire, just the stove being on. You wouldn't let the kids come around it. So just a complete reforming of our understanding of what life is today for young people when they step out of our door and how we must prepare them, protect them, and really raise them up. Let me pause and say, are there any other questions? Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, ignorance, again, it, it all boils down to ignorance because it, it, it's one thing, like my heart breaks for people who choose the wrong way, but ultimately they, you know, they, they fully conscientiously chose that way, but it's a completely different story when, when the majority of people are giving up their sons and daughters to Molech, as it were, offering them as a sacrifice to the enemy and they're doing it ignorantly. That to me is, is the greatest curse. And so that's why I said ignorance is the greatest pain in society. Let's just get intelligent. You don't have to condemn someone to educate them. You can just, can, you can, you can um, enlighten them. So there, there's, there's no condemnation here. You can just, and they're responsible to do with what they have, what light they have. They're responsible for that. But it's our duty to educate and bring things to the light. I think if we care about souls, for sure. Uh, Natasha. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much for 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 the presentation. That was that was wonderful. Um, maybe you can you can post it. You can post the the YouTube link to the group so we can share it. Uh, and you know the fact that he has he has finished presentation now does not mean uh he is done. He's not done. He's just put it on on air so we can spread it out the rest of the year to different groups uh, because it's a powerful presentation we have to we have to share this we have to we have to pick the bull by the horn uh, if you don't if you don't pick the bull by the horn now the bull will terrorize you so what he's talking about, like uh, you know, if you if you don't educate your children, the world will educate them their own way. And if you don't educate the church, the church will educate the community in their own way. Like now we have 
we have we have these groups in the church we have we have these groups in the church we have these groups among our own uh, you know communities and, and and even families so unless unless we aggressively do this we we won't we won't we can't make it so thank you so much for for the presentation uh, natasha send it to to us and we will do the necessary absolutely yes i will do that so I'm going to pause right here and um, stop recording.